So I'd like to continue this discussion of the ideas that underlie the finite element method. And in particular, what I would like to talk about is that in um, the previous uh, few lectures, I uh, explained why piecewise polynomial approximation is such a powerful tool, that it uh, can resolve functions that are uh, maybe may poorly behaved in some parts of the domain and are smooth in other parts of the domain. And that um, piecewise polynomial approximation is just generally a good way how to um, describe functions with finitely much information, with finitely many uh, computations, um, and still get something that is accurate and, um, in fact, converges to the exact solution if we're willing to put in more effort, more memory, um, in particular if we make the interval smaller and smaller and smaller in 1D, for example. So the question, of course, still remains, um, now that we've figured out how we would like to approximate functions, how do I actually find an approximation, right? Um, and fundamentally, this comes down to the question, well, I have this PDE, but I don't know the exact solution, so I cannot interpolate it either, right? Um, if I knew the exact solution, then the interpolation problem would not be necessary. I could simply evaluate the exact solution, but I do not know the exact solution. And so from a practical perspective, that raises the question then, well, how do I find a uh, piecewise polynomial uh, function that hopefully is a good approximation to the exact solution of the PDE? And that's the topic of this lecture. So let's look at this from a, um, a practical perspective, and it uses a concept that is called uh, weak solutions, and in particular, the Galerkin process. So the question that I would like to answer in this question is, in, in this lecture is how do you find such an approximation of the solution of a PDE without actually knowing it, the solution? So let us go back to the uh, one-dimensional case. So I would like to solve, for example, something like the Laplace equation. And in, in 1D, the Laplace equation is simply minus the second derivatives of u equals f. Okay? And I... Um, would like to find an approximation to this function u of x that in general I do not know. Um, I would like to find a piecewise linear or piecewise polynomial approximation, and I'm going to call this piecewise polynomial approximation uh. And h, as always, indicates something like the uh, size of the mesh, the diameter of the cells or intervals that I'm going to consider. So in order to um, come up with a um, with a way of um, describing how exactly I can find these sort of solutions, it's worthwhile to think a little bit about how do I actually represent um, solutions. And um, you've seen this already in uh, the last lecture, um, that I can represent a, a piecewise polynomial function as a superposition of what we call basis functions. Um, so the basis functions are these phi j's here, and there are coefficients u j's, so the phi j's are things that I'm, that I choose, that I already know. The u j's, these are the unknowns. These are the coefficients that I try to identify. And so, for example, if I'm trying to represent this thick blue uh, function here, I can represent this as, well, this green triangle here, this um, light blue triangle, and this um, orange triangle, okay? And um, how are they defined? So these shape functions phi j, these are the, the green, the light blue, and the orange functions that vary between 0 and 1, for example. And then these coefficients, well, these are simply the heights of the function at this particular location. So you will notice that um, at this location, at, 0 .5, at minus 0 0.5, for example, the um, all other shape functions are 0 except of the green one. And so my u green, the coefficient that corresponds to this green function would be 0 0.3, the second coefficient would be 0 0.4, and the third coefficient would again be 0 0.3. So in other words, a piecewise linear um, function, a piecewise polynomial function more generally, can be written as a sum of certain coefficients times basis functions. And um, so in other words, then what I'm looking for in order to characterize my piecewise uh, polynomial approximation uh, is really only these coefficients uj. And there are finitely many, let's say n of these, 
And so the question of solving um, the approximation problem for this PDE comes down to finding these coefficients, right? So it becomes hopefully a linear um, equation, for example, a system of linear equations that I have to solve for these coefficients. Okay, so I've reduced this problem um, from finding some abstract polynomial approximation to a concrete set of coefficients. And um, how do I find them? And the answer is, of course, I need to uh, use the PDE. The PDE describes what exactly the solution is supposed to be. So the PDE contains the information that I need to find these coefficients, uj here. So you might have a simple first idea um, that would be, okay, so I know that this piecewise polynomial approximation can be expressed in this form. Why don't I just put this into the differential equation here and ask for this to be equal to f? That seems like a good idea in theory, but in practice, of course, this does not work very well. And the reason for that is, remember, uh is piecewise linear. So the second derivatives in the interior of each interval are actually zero. Okay, so in the interior, for all of the x's that are inside these individual intervals, the left-hand side here is zero, it cannot be equal to whatever right-hand side f of x you're given. That's simply not going to work. And the second part is that this um, uh is a piecewise linear function, so it has kinks at the node points. And so I could maybe argue that, okay, so I can sort of form first derivatives, that would be a discontinuous function, but for sure taking second derivatives of a function with kink is not going to work. These second derivatives are simply not defined at node points. And so the consequence of this is, well, that will not help me to find these coefficients uj, uh, because the second derivative here cannot equal minus f of x. That's just not going to happen. So what do we do instead? Um, so here's a, um, uh, an observation um, that if I ask you, um, what does it actually mean for g of x to be equal h of x? Um, if I tell you what the x is, um, then you only have to compare the g function evaluated at x against the h function evaluated at x, and these are just numbers, and we know how to compare numbers. But when I ask you, when is the function equal g, when is the function g equal the function h, that is actually a much more complicated question, because suddenly you have to ask questions about what do you actually mean by this equality? Do you mean that these two functions have to be the same for every possible x? Or maybe for almost every x, maybe it's okay if they're the same almost everywhere, but not quite everywhere. And there are many other ways how you could define this. And I'm going to come back to this um, in the next lecture where I'm going to look at this from a more mathematical perspective. But so conceptually, um, the problem is that I can really only compare numbers. I know how to compare numbers, but for functions, it is much more complicated to define what, what the equality actually means. And so sometime in the late 1800s and early 1900s, people came up with this concept of the weak formulation of a um, differential equation. And it goes fundamentally like this. So in order to compare two different functions for equality, what I really should be doing is I should compare functionals applied to them. So a functional is um, uh, something that takes a function as an argument and returns a number, for example, an integral integral from 0 to 1 applied to a function returns a number, namely the area under that function. So um, if I had infinitely many of these functionals applied to g, and each one of those is equal to the corresponding functional applied to h, then what I only have to compare here is numbers, right? Um, f1 of g is a number, and f1 of h is also a number. And for numbers, the question is unambiguous. Either they're the same or they're not. And so um, this weak formulation of this problem always um, goes this route, that we say, I'm going to prescribe certain functionals, and I'm going to say that g equals h if all of these functionals applied to g equals the corresponding functional applied to h. 
So let me show you examples. Um, so um, a possible way of defining these functionals would be to say, okay, so the first functional is simply the integral from zero to one. The next one is the integral x times g of x, then x squared g of x. So these are what we call the moments of a function. So if all of the moments of a function equal the corresponding moments of the other function h, then we would say the two of them are the same. Okay, and that becomes now an unambiguous statement. Either the moments are the same or the moments are not the same. And I do not have to worry anymore about, well, what exactly, at what point are g and x maybe possibly different and in what ways are they different? So um, this approach through these functionals is actually quite a useful technique to compare the left and the right hand side of something that has to hold at every x. Another possible choice would be that um, I say the first functional is simply the integral of g of x. Um, the next one is the integral of sine pi x times g of x. And then the next one is cosine pi x and so on and so forth. And so in this case, what I have on the left and on the right are simply the Fourier expansion coefficients up to some constant. So again, I would say that uh, g and h are equal if, for example, the Fourier coefficients are the same. Right? So that, that's sort of the spirit of this, um, of this approach. So again, if um, I have an infinite number of these appropriate functionals, then I would say that these two functions are the same. And um, the question, of course, then arises, well, what is an appropriate set of functionals? And that is something that um, we have to do um, in an appropriate way for PDEs, right? On, you will remember that g of x is something like minus d, over, d squared of the x squared uh, u of x, and the right-hand side h is simply the right-hand side of the PDE. So for differential equations, we would like to have this sort of equality, that um, we are looking for functions u of x, and we call those the weak solutions for which these functionals applied to minus the second derivatives equals corresponding functionals to apply to the right-hand side of the PDE. And the uh, functionals that we will choose are of the following form, integral some function phi k g of x dx for an infinite set of functions. So that's what we call the weak solution of a PDE, a function u that satisfies this for an infinite set of um, phi k's. Or put differently, for all test functions phi of x. That's an equivalent formulation. So that's the mathematical notation we're going to choose. The integral of the test function phi of x times the second derivatives equals the integral of test functions times the right-hand side for all possible test functions phi. Okay, so now the question was still, how do we choose these phi's? And in order to understand how we want to choose these phi's, it's useful to first um, think about whether we can make this formulation a little bit more symmetric. Um, so the way we do this is that we integrate this by parts, right? So I have the integral over my interval or my domain um, of phi times minus the second derivatives. And if I integrate this by parts once, I'm going to get that this is the integral d over dx phi times d over dx u of x plus boundary terms. And for the purposes of this class or this lecture, I will simply ignore the boundary terms. So I will say that u of x is a weak solution if integral d over dx phi d over dx u equals integral phi times f. This is equivalent, again, I should say that. Um, so this problem integral that phi prime u prime equals integral phi times f for all phi is the same as saying that this equation has to hold for my basis function phi 1, for my basis function phi 2, and so on and so forth, because every function can be expressed as phi of x times, uh, phi of x equals the sum of these coefficients ck phi k. And that is a statement about the set of functions that I'm considering. Namely, there is a uh, innumerable basis to this space. There is a mathematical theory that I could go into, but um, when I say something like this, so that every function is expressible in this form here, 
Okay, so you can think of these phi k's, for example, as sines and cosines, and then you know that every function can be represented by its Fourier series. Okay, so if I can say this, then this statement here, that this is true for every phi, in particular, it would be true for a phi for which these coefficients are, the first one is one and all of the others are zero. Okay, so then that statement here is in particular true for phi equals phi one. Well, that gives me this equation here, okay? But it's also true for phi equals phi two, so that gives me this equation. So um, it's easy to see that this one implies this, and then if you multiply these equations with these coefficients ck, then add them up, then you're going to go from this statement here to this statement. So to say that something is true for every phi is the same as saying that all of these equations hold true for the specific basis functions phi one and phi two. Okay, so I know that the exact solution satisfies this equation here. So the exact solution is this function u for which this statement is true for all phi's. And so then you could argue, okay, so maybe then I just need to put in my approximation uh, this piecewise linear or piecewise polynomial function. Maybe I just need to stick this in here and get the following statement here. And that seems like a good idea um, until you realize that um, well, I have really only n coefficients here, but you remember that this statement here was equivalent to a sequence of equations for phi 1, phi 2, phi 3, and so on. The words. There's infinitely many equations. So I have n unknowns, these uj's, but I have infinitely many equations. And that's clearly not going to work. So we will have to think about this a little bit. On the positive side, you see already that um, we can now work with piecewise linears because we've gotten rid of our second, second derivative here, right? We've only, we're only left with first derivatives, and the advantage of the first derivatives is that, well, if I have a piecewise linear function, the first derivatives are defined on the interior of the intervals, and maybe they're, the first derivative forms a discontinuous function, but then when I integrate over it, I don't actually have to define what happens at the node points. So that's a quite a convenient reformulation because it really only requires to have first derivatives and functions with kinks are fine in this regard. Okay, but the problem with the infinitely many equations persists and of course the way we deal with this is that when I say, okay, so it doesn't work if, when I say this is true for all possible phi's here. Maybe I just need to restrict myself to the first n of these phi's, namely the specific, these phi's, the phi's that I have considered here, the ones from which I built my, um, my piecewise polynomial approximation. So if I only use these n phi's, then this statement here is equivalent to exactly n equations for n unknowns. And that is something that is called the Galerkin method. So the Galerkin method simply says, well, if I take um, a set of n basis functions phi j's, and I consider exactly those n shape functions or basis functions as test functions, as these test functions here, that gives me n equations and n unknowns. That's what we call the Galerkin method. And that is the key insight that we use for the finite element method. So, Equivalently, this reads as follows, right? So I have this uh, is uh, expressed in terms of this ex expansion here. And so um, the statement for all test functions phi h in, that I can write as a linear combination of these phi j's is exactly equivalent to saying that this is true for test function phi 1 here and for a separate equation for phi 2 n times. So I get exactly these n equations for in unknowns. I should um, add a little bit about uh, notation um, because we will use this throughout uh, the remainder of these uh, lectures. In the finite element community, we typically uh, write things as follows. So um, when you write parentheses, G comma H parentheses, um, and sometimes you have this index here and sometimes you don't, then um, that is supposed to be equal to the integral g of x, h of x, dx. Um, and we write it like this because it is really an inner product. An inner product is you give me two vectors and 
returns a number. Um, so in this case, the vectors are functions, right? Um, so uh, you give me two functions, g of x and h of x, and an inner product results in a number that um, corresponds to some sort of inner product between um, g and h. And so with this notation here, um, then the reformulation, this weak formulation of my problem reads as follows. So it is the inner product of d over dx phi h, d over dx uh, equals the inner product of phi h and f, where these phi h's have this form here. So this formulation, this whole thing here, that's how we typically write the finite element method. Similarly, if you wanted to write this in terms of n equations, then you start with just this integral, and then you express this integral of something times something in terms of this parenthesis, something comma, something else, parenthesis. Oh, the dx should disappear here. The dx um, is no longer necessary. So um, how does this work in higher dimensions? Um, you fundamentally follow the same process. So we want that minus the Laplace of u equals f, okay, x is now a vector in two or three dimensional space. You multiply this equation with the test function and then you integrate over it, okay? So I have integral phi times minus Laplace equals integral phi times f. And then I integrate the parts here. Um, so the integration by parts yields that this becomes the integral of gradient phi times gradient u, plus boundary terms that, again, I'm going to neglect here because they're not terribly important from the perspective of explaining what the finite element method does. But of course, they, they are important for actually implementing a concrete solver to a problem. But at least for the purposes of the theory, explaining the ideas, that's not important. So I integrate by parts, get a gradient phi here and a gradient phi here. And if I want to write this in shorthand notation, then that gives me integral gradient phi h gradient phi j equals integral phi h times f, right? And so you already see that when I see parentheses, parentheses, I often read this as integral phi j gradient, integral gradient phi h gradient uh. So that's sort of the, um, the fundamental idea. And again, because these phi h's here are a sum of coefficients times phi k, the way you should really read this is when I say that this is true for all phi h, that's really n equations that come out of this. So that leaves me um, with multiple questions. Um, so the first one that's not even on the slide is, can I make this more mathematical? And I'm going to do this in the next lecture where I give you a little bit of a background why the weak formulation is the way to go. Um, but so for now, at least, simply take it as this is how we do it. But then um, out of the uh, first two questions that I answered in the previous lectures, there arise more. So I should ask the um, third question, for example, well, is this UH that I defined through this weak formulation actually close to the exact solution? Right? We don't know that yet. We only know, well, here is a way to compute some UH. But is it good? The other part that I should, of course, address is, well, does this UH converge towards you? So I've showed you that if you do an interpolation problem, if you make these intervals smaller and smaller, the interpolant, the approximate, converges to the function that you're trying to approximate. But is this true also for the, finite, for the Galerkin approximation UH? Does it converge to the exact solution of the PDE? And maybe a third question or fifth question by now that we should ask is, does that actually yield a scheme that is computationally efficient? Um, is there some optimality in this? So is this maybe the best way to approximate PDEs? Can I show that among all of the possible ways how I could approximate a function and about all of the possible ways how I can define how an approximation looks like, is this the best one? And so these are, of course, all difficult questions. Um, the first two is something that is not overly difficult to answer, and we're going to do this two lectures from now. The last one, that's a much more difficult question that um, will have to be left for later lectures. But so at least for the moment, um, that's what I wanted to say about the um, 
uh, way in which the finite element approximation is defined. Namely, um, I say that I want to look for a approximate for a numerical solution of a PDE among all of the piecewise uh, polynomial functions. And then I use the Galerkin process to define how exactly do I find this approximation. That's sort of the general approach to this. And um, then we will have to well, mop up some of the mathematical details in a later lecture.